Good afternoon. How are we feeling? See, Benedictus is feeling my energy. I want all of you to be energetic. Come on, this is exciting stuff. I want to get you excited in conservation, despite the stories that we're going to tell you. <laughs> all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the second of what would be four presentations of mine today, so you'll be quite tired of listening to me. But I hope I can engage you in, um, I think, what is a really broad but also very interesting topic. A um, couple of things I want you to keep in mind. One, these are not necessarily my ideas. I am pooling things from the literature. Secondly, I will defer to clarification and comment to my colleagues. And periodically, I will ask you to comment on certain things. Okay, so I don't want to make this completely a uh, lecture where uh, I am the voice and you are the passive listeners, but rather think about how to challenge certain ideas and move it forward, right? But let's keep in mind that we want to not dwell so long on questions because there is material to cover. So, Hailu, one question. <laughs> you know, Hailu, when he, when he uh, asks a question, it tends to go on for a good, uh, you know, three or four days. But no, it's good. It's good. It's good. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Um, the title here is Conservation in Sub-Saharan Africa. What worked? What didn't work? Why and for whom? And in here, I am trying to bring in questions and thoughts and ideas that perhaps we have not more fully considered. Okay? The key to a lot of these lecturers is to tell you something that you didn't know. And we want you to leave here with new information. I doubt any of you have come here to be told what you already know. Right? Right. So here's our outline. We're going to go over what the key learning objectives are for this, this lecture. What are the things that I want, we want, all of you to take away with this. We'll talk about an overview of conservation practices and then get into the details of what worked, what didn't work and why. Who, benefit, who benefited and who lost out? I think this is really important because we think of conservation as simply being a one-way street. And then to pay attention to what are the constructive ways in which we can use this information to move forward. Okay? So not just a critique, but to think about ways by which to move this forward. Okay? So here are some of the key learning objectives that we want you to take away from this. To understand the complex history of protected area conservation and conservation strategies, right? To understand what is called the nature-culture binary, which is nature simply exists in one realm and culture in the other, and that's the way it has been and that's the way it will be. We want to defeat that perspective. To think in terms of institutions as well as individual or group agency. This classic debate in the social sciences is about decision making. Are decisions best made by institutional structures or are decisions made through individual agency? Fourth, to think beyond the static nature of people and protected areas. Okay? It's not just one influences the other, end of story. It's much more complex than that. The root of understanding conservation strategies is, in my thinking, rooted in understanding land tenure security. Who owns land? And to think about the relationship between nature and capitalism. Okay. These are all new ideas that are coming up, and we want to share those with you. Everyone on board so far? Give me some feedback, not some heads. Awesome. Great. So, if we look at uh, the overview of conservation practices, this is stuff that you saw before in a, in a, in a previous presentation. Right? One of the things I forgot to add is here a, a point, a very important point that, uh, that Lee brought up, which is the, the large-scale prioritization of, of key uh, ecosystematic areas. Um, for example, the African Wildlife Foundation has this thing they called African heartlands. Uh, what is the specific phrasing used by CI in terms of or um, biodiversity hotspots? Biodiversity hotspots, right? And so these are the different eras that we've talked about. 
Okay? Now, when we talk about conservation practices, who is involved in conservation? Plants and animals? They'd like to be conserved, right? We assume. They can't speak. Give me some feedback. Right? Local communities are vested partners in conservation. The state is vested in nature conservation. But there are also conservation organizations at multiple levels. The local level, the national level, the international level. But the international community as a whole is also interested in nature conservation. And I think the biggest example we can provide of this is um, uh, the Amazonian rainforest, which spans multiple countries and is often th thought of as a carbon sink. Right? It absorbs the carbon that we're, we're emitting. And therefore, who should be concerned in preserving the Amazonian rainforest? Is it the indigenous people? Is it the Brazilian state? Is it the international community? Because the Amazonian rainforest is thought of as the lungs of the earth. It absorbs all that carbon. Right? So the question then comes up is if all these different folks are interested in nature conservation, one, is it fair to assume that all of these groups have the same interests? What do you think? All of these groups would not have the, the, the same interests. So give me an example. In what ways would the interests of, say, a local conservation NGO differ with an international NG, uh, uh, conservation organization? Provide some examples from your home countries. Yanko? Sacred sites, yeah. okay. So they conserve those areas for their own cultural practices, and okay. Not for maybe wildlife or biodiversity purposes, okay. And that may be different from what an international NGO look at, it okay. For biodiversity purposes, okay. So we have this issue of competing interests, right? Broadly, everyone will say we are interested in nature conservation, but perhaps the differences start to emerge when it comes to the control and the actual strategies that are being deployed, right? So if there are these different vested interests, how do we begin to prioritize different actors and institutions? What factors should we consider in these prior this prioritization? If we're going to prioritize they necessarily, I think, please correct me here if I'm wrong, somebody will gain and somebody will lose in the prioritization. Right? So what are we willing to give up? And what are we willing to gain? What are the intended and unintended consequences of that prioritization? So, for example, if we're interested in conserving elephants, I think you would all agree that conserving elephants is a good thing. <laughs> How would we go about conserving elephants? What is the main strategy that we might use? Lee? Well, we might have a strategy. Devil's yeah, we might have please. a strategy where we know that a lot of money can be made from killing elephants, and so we should um, create situations that create markets for elephant products and the free trade of elephant products. Okay. Sort of the opposite of the ivory band philosophy. Okay. And that, that idea certainly exists in right. Southern Africa. And what would be the flip side of that? What's that? In the long run, we might lose a lot of elephants. Okay. Yeah. So, so we have to do some, some prioritization. Now, what about the fact that something that is considered a good idea at time one 
we look at back in history and say, wow, that was a horrible idea. Has that happened before in your experiences? Yes. Give me some examples. Mike. The, the, the issue of planting eucalyptus. The idea of planting eucalyptus? <laughs> okay. In certain resource, okay. like watershed in my country is becoming a big issue. Okay. They, they think that um, those who had the idea were somehow crazy. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. a big argument. So Okay. Was the planting of Prosopia juliflora considered a good idea? It was a government idea. It was a government idea. It was funded very much by international development NGOs, right? Yeah. And now we are trying to get rid of it. And now we think, yeah. bad idea. We probably shouldn't have done that. Okay. So we have to keep in mind the dynamic nature of ideas that come and go. So let's think about what has worked and why. Let's go back to this slide that you've seen before. There are 105,000 protected areas globally. There are different categories of protected areas. National parks, national reserves, forest parks, forest reserves, wildlife conservation authorities, community conservancies, etc., etc. If you want to look at this slide and say, look, if we're broadly interested in preserving biodiversity, we need lots of protected areas. So, according to this, it's a success, right? No? No, it's yeah. dropping. It's so, we should c have more and more protected areas. Do we want this curve to go this way? Where's that land going to come from? Plateau somewhere. Plateau instead of dropping off? But if it plateaus, that means we're still adding. Mm -hmm. Stability. Stability? But this is by year still adding, right? So if we want more protected areas, where's the land going to come from? But more importantly, what are we conserving? And how, and really depends, to determine whether something is successful, we have to de evaluate what the criteria of success is. Is more national parks simply by raw numbers considered success? Does it depend on the number of species? Does it depend on the multiple number of multiple species associations, the MSAs? Are we actually thinking about these sorts of issues? So success depends on the definition. It also depends on what it is that we're trying to preserve. If the original question is, we need to preserve nature for nature's sake, then the establishment of, is, the con is the establishment of several protected areas considered a success? I think all, some of you would probably say, mm, no, you need to be a little bit more clear, right? If the question is, we need to save endemic species to preserve genetic diversity, have we achieved that? Lee says no. What do some of you, uh, you think? You guys are very quiet this afternoon. <laughs> think about that. I think it depends on the species. I think it depends on the tape changes. Is our goal to document or to preserve every single species on the planet? Is that a realistic goal? What if the question is, we have to protect nature for future generations? Does that sound like a plausible one? Which nature? <laughs> what do you think? Nature defined by whom, for whom? Hmm. Seems to me like we need to do a lot more thinking. So, if we're interested in conserving nature for nature's sake, Mona, please, question. Since you yes, <laughs> I invited not, comments. Uh, happy with the quiet yes. room. Yeah. So who decides what's nature and what's people? That's, that's a great question. Mona's question is, who decides? Who, who makes the definition? Who that makes the definition? Great on. question. If you're working for the national museums of your particular country, who makes that decision? 
all the scientists in the museum? The bureaucrats? The politi the politicians make the Oh my god, what do you mean the politicians make the decisions? Because you said political ecology. Yeah. No, that's right. I think I think all the ecology is political. Okay. So so we have to rely on existing information. Right? Do we know how accurate that information is? <laughs> Sounds highly subjective to me, Emily. But, but this is what I want us to think about. These things that have long been assumed to be clearly defined are in fact quite vague. Who makes the decision about how many protected areas to establish? Where the protected area should be? How it should operate? What species it should be conserving? Is that done in consultation? Is it the will of international powerful NGOs like WWF? Maybe a bit of everyone? Okay. So if we're thinking about nature conserving for nature's sake, who is nature for? People. People should enjoy it for future generations. Which people? People get, that can afford to go to the parks? International tourists? If it's for animals, which animals? Should we preserve elephants at the expense of hyrax? Should we preserve rhino at the expense of cheetah? Different people view nature differently. That is the number one thing that I want you to take away from this as to why conservation has not worked well. Different people value nature differently. And this affects the scientists, it affects the, the practitioners, right? I think there was a wonderful map a number of years ago that showed the global biodiversity hotspots in relation to the number of publications in that area. And there was no surprise that they overlapped onto each other, right? So at this moment, I want us to take a small break and think about a notion of sustainability, which is endemic within our thinking about protected area conservation, right? And who can define sustainability for me? We use it a lot. Please tell me what it means. It doesn't have to be a formal definition. Whatever you think sustainability is, in your opinion. How have you heard the term being used? say it's a non-destructive use. Non-destructive use. Yeah, or sometimes it could be a little bit destructive, but it gives this the chance for resilience. Okay. Yeah. Others? Time in it? It is to use the resources without affecting the future generation to use uh, to, to use the without affecting their chance to use the resource. For future generations. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Mike? I, I think it's to, to make use of the resource in a way that it will be continuous. Okay. Throughout. Okay. Those are all great points and certainly echoes how um, the UN has thought about sustainability. Right? Is it, is it useful? Or is it just a buzzword that we like to deploy? It's useful. I will disagree with you. <laughs> I want to bring in some comments that, that so, some issues that some scientists have been working on. And you can disagree or, or agree with this. That's completely up to you. I don't want to impose that on you. I just want to bring this relevant. Which is some scientists have said, maybe it's, it's time to think about the end of sustainability. It's not a terribly useful concept. Why? Well, let's have a look specifically at the language that has been used on this. The time has come for us to collectively re-examine and ultimately move past the concept of sustainability. The continuing invocation of sustainability in policy discussion ignores the emerging realities of the Anthropocene. Mona talked about what the Anthropocene is. 
which is creating a world characterized by extreme complexity, radical uncertainty, and unprecedented change. From a policy perspective, we must, must face the impossibility of even defining, let alone pursuing, the goal of sustainability in such a world. It's not that sustainability is a bad idea. The question is whether the concept of sustainability is still useful as an environmental governance framework. So thinking about for future generations, what does that mean? So that our children can enjoy it? Our children's children can enjoy it? Something just to put in the back of your mind and to think about a little more. Now, in, in thinking about questions of conservation, we are interested in conserving things for animals, right? Would you agree that animals have a right to a peaceful, conflict-free life? Does the elephant have a right to roam unrestricted in its home range? Does the lion? Do animals have rights? Mona. Depends who you ask. I think Depends who you ask. I think many people would say yes. Okay. Animal have rights. I animals have rights. I would agree with you. Also plants. You should consider plants. Plants have rights too. Right? So if we agree that animals have rights, can animals speak for themselves? Uh, this really shouldn't be a difficult one. <laughs> in their own way. But in, in order to convince us, we probably have to have some interpreters, some like animal rights practitioners. Tell me. Yeah. When you say animals have rights, are you comparing animal, one animal with another animal or with human being? Great question. Yeah, I'm coming to that. <laughs> I'm coming to that. And this is not, this should not be a strange concept to you because uh, what I'm getting at here is uh, a wonderful series of works that has been done by lots of people, most well known by, uh, by Peter Singer, who has issued what he calls the call to right action. And he says this, how is it that we have broadened our moral horizons to include populations that have historically had no rights, we had no rights for women, minorities, the infirm, without extending those concerns beyond the hu human species to include animals, and I would agree with Mona, plants as well. Additionally, Peter Singer's main argument here is that things that experience suffering, not plants, <laughs> not true, I think, I think Mona and Lee are going to have a very good discussion here in a second. Um, interests of animals should be considered because of their ability to feel suffering. Right? If something suffers, it has rights. This is what Peter Singer says. Mike is shifting uneasily in his chair, which is great. Okay? And here you want to extend the idea of utilitarianism. The greatest good for the greatest number of people. So if something experiences suffering, I should do whatever I can to try and eliminate that suffering. How many of you have seen pictures of badly mutilated elephants? What are your emotions when you see that picture? You feel bad. Very sad. Very sad. Did that animal experience suffering? So by Peter Singer's argument, the elephant should have rights. Ben, let's hold on the question. I want to finish this point and then come back. OK? So Peter Singer's arguments about animal rights and ethics should strive to maximizing the good that society can produce. So if we minimize the suffering of animals, it's good for all of us. Sounds like a great point for conservation, right? No? You don't agree? Okay, let's, let's hold on that. And so a prerequisite for maximizing good is to eliminate suffering. Singer does not claim, Tamena's point here, equal treatment of all animals 
In other words, Peter Singer is not saying that animals should have the same rights as humans. He's saying they deserve equal consideration. Okay. With this in mind, let's go back to protected areas in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? So as has been mentioned several times, there's been a long history of colonial rule across the continent. The dominant model that has been used is the fortress conservation for much of its early period, right? But in this determination of these early protected areas, we have to think about boundaries, right? Something that is inside a protected area and something that is outside, right? And so what factors would you consider as to where that boundary should be? Where should the boundary be? Come on, guys. Ben? I think uh, we look at it from two perspectives. One from the animals. Okay. So we look at the large uh, range species, if it's an elephant. That one thing that will influence the boundaries. And on the other side, we also look at the people. Where are they? And to what extent is this place being crushed or degraded? Okay. That's one of the things we consider in determining the boundaries. Okay. What if it was 1940? Do you think people were thinking that sophisticated? No. I don't want to believe so, but it depends. <laughs> you were saying no. I want to hear why. <laughs> no, I guess they know, but me, I think they no. They didn't adequately consider no, that. No. Does anyone agree with her? Yeah, I think I, I will. Yeah, partly agree with her because, like, for example, there is. But you disagree. Now you agree. So <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, I didn't disagree actually. But the, I will give an example of, of the national park we have, the uh -huh. Apple National Park. It was not back in the 1940s, but it was designated in the early 80s. Uh -huh. But then the idea was not based on any scientific evidence of species. Wow. And okay. Uh, it was based on there is a big vast land somewhere and it has a lot of forest yes so we can just preserve this so are you saying that sometimes we just set aside large land areas and then later decided what species that were in it should be preserved sure, sure. And okay I don't think that is wrong either. you don't think that's wrong either yeah. I, I would agree with you okay. I agree with you, yeah, you from, the, from the conservation biology perspective okay Okay. Do any of my colleagues want to disagree with that point? I think it's crucial to make decisions expediently, which is necessarily going to work based on incomplete information. That's a great point. Even sometimes with the perfect amount of information, which is, let's be honest, not realistic, we have to work with what we have. Right? It comes back to this notion of priorities. What do we choose to prioritize over other things? Right? So, things we have to think for. What species do you protect for? 